Um, I'm Todd Rapone. I'm Associate University Librarian for Digital Initiatives and Information Technology at UCLA. This is my colleague Stephen Davison, who's head of our Digital Library Program. Um, we've been uh, working with a couple of collaborative partners over the last few years. Uh, uh, the partner, uh, partnership is between UCLA Library and uh, something called EMIL, the Early Manuscript Electronic Library. Uh, we've been using um, multispectral uh, imaging techniques to capture hidden texts. And so a lot of these techniques were developed on the Archimedes Palimpsest project a few years ago. UCLA didn't have much involvement in that. But the technology that was developed has found uh, uh, many more uh, places, many more, uh, ut much more utility. Um, and so we're going to talk about that. So uh, here's the, um, what you see here is a fragment of one of the things we're going to talk about this morning, which is uh, David Livingston's field diaries. So this is what it looks like. Uh, as a scanned image. Um, and with multispectral technology, uh, you can reveal a lot of the text that was hidden. And I'll, we'll talk more about what it is and what it does soon. Um, so, uh, multispectral imaging, I'll give a brief introduction. Stephen's going to talk a lot more about it. Uh, but it's also called uh, fluorescent spectral imaging. It's a pretty new science, um, it captures image data at specific frequencies across the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, the wavelengths are separated by filters or by the use of instrumentation that are uh, sensitive to particular wavelengths, um, specifically in this case wavelengths of light, uh, both visible and invisible to the human eye, um, uh, such as infrared. Um, this uh, imaging can uh, allow for the extraction of additional information the human eye can't see um, we've used it on um, the uh, Livingston Spectral Imaging Project, um, and we are, uh, our collaborations are now uh, dealing with um, palimpsests at St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt. So palimpsests are really just recycled manuscripts. So these are uh, very frugal monks. Uh, a long time ago, the paper was very expensive. They would um, write on a text, turn the page, write right on top of the other one. Um, and so there's, uh, we're using this imaging technology to reveal the text hidden behind the text. So you'll see a little bit more of that later on um, when we go into the uh, demo. So I mentioned before like what multispectral imaging is. Um, so it takes these different wavelengths like ultraviolet, uh, blue, green, red, infrared. And so uh, these LED lights project onto a manuscript, they're filtered by the lens, and over here you see what we end up with, which is uh, scanned images filtered by color. All right? Um, and so what we do is after you get all those images, we use computer software to kind of combine them in ways that uh, allow you to um, look at the uh, look at the final image with these different filters on, so you can use those different colors as different wavelengths to reveal some of the hidden text. Um, as I mentioned before, this is a collaboration uh, between uh, the UCLA Library. Uh, we've done. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say something back here. Uh, so they use a strobe light <coughs> and si 16 different wavelengths. Um, here you see uh, just three that are visible to the human eye, um, a couple of them that aren't, um, but 16 different light wavelengths, I guess, is, is the important piece. This is just a, a slice. Um, so many people are involved in this project, from project scientists to imaging specialists to catalogers. Uh, we have some who do field work, some who code remotely, uh, catalog remotely. It's really a global team from England to Los Angeles, uh, collaborators in Pennsylvania, Hawaii, Europe, um, Egypt, all over the place. Um, we try to add value, UCLA tries to add value um, by assisting in the conservation, collection management, and scholarly access to the, um, the scanned content. Um, and the institutions 
that are holding the manuscripts uh, share in the results too. So that it'll be important later on when I talk about some aspects of the project, why that's important. Just a little bit more detail about what multispectral imaging is. Um, I'm going to sit down if that's okay with you. Um, so, multispectral imaging uh, is used to, for the study of cultural objects. It involves illuminating an object with successive wavelengths of light um, from the infrared to the ultraviolet. So, it's important to emphasize that it's both visible and invisible light. We are uh, used to thinking of digitization as um, a technique of capturing the reflection of, of visible light, but um, the ultraviolet and infrared are, are, are important aspects in this. Um, and then uh, digitally photographing the resulting illuminations. Um, second major point is that these images um, all have exactly, if you take 16 different images of the same item, the same page, um, they all have, it's important that they all have exactly the same uh, pixel layout, that they all be identical as far as the structure of the images are concerned because of the processing that you're going to do on those images later, they've got to match pixel for pixel. So the, um, they capture these 12 different, well, typically 12 to 16, depends on the project. Um, you, you capture these images automatically using a computer driven application and strobe lights. Um, so that the, there's no human uh, intervention uh, during the actual imaging process. And in each of these frequencies, um, you're talking about essentially a monochromatic image. I mean, if you think about it, there's only one frequency, it's monochromatic. So you're really capturing the density of the reflected wavelengths of light at those specific, um, uh, those specific wavelengths. And TIFF being the standard for most imaging, is, it obviously makes sense to store them as, as standard TIFF files, monochromatic TIFF files. Um, and, and, and depending on the project, as high resolution as you need. So typically, you're going to take 16 very high resolution images of, uh, a, of, a, of a single page, and you have many pages, you end up with very large amounts of data. So these projects typically um, are very data heavy. The Archimedes Palimpsest was uh, probably the most famous in the first of these projects, and a lot of the techniques which have been developed over time were developed during the, Palimpsest, the Archimedes Palimpsest project. For those of you who may not have heard of it, it's um, a 13th century prayer book um, which contained erased text that it turns out include um, a couple of um, texts by Archimedes that were hitherto unknown. Um, as well as a number of other um, unknown texts. It is in the Walters, uh, it's actually owned by a private owner, but it's, it's in the Walters Art Museum in, in Baltimore, in Maryland. And it's been used, it's, it's been studied extensively for a whole range of different reasons. Um, conservation, imaging, scholarship, all sorts. It's an extremely well studied um, uh, document. And a lot of the uh, spectral imaging techniques that we're going to talk about in a moment, were developed by the team that worked on that project. And elements of that team have worked on the Livingston project I'll talk about in a minute, and also the, um, the St. Catherine's Monastery of Palimpsest project. Um, as Todd mentions, the team, um, the imaging team, the team of image scientists, are currently working uh, with funding from the Arca Arcadia Fund on a project to, um, to uh, image and to study palimpsests at the Monastery of St. Catharines in the Sinai Desert in Egypt. And that looks like a model, but it's actually real. <laughs> um, it's one of the places on the planet I would really quite like to go and visit. Um, it is the oldest existing, continually inhabited um, monastery in the world. It was founded in the, let me not get this wrong, um, I think in the, was it the 7th century? Oh, I, mean, I don't actually have that written down, but uh, 7th, 8th century, it's that old, it's never been destroyed, it's never been overrun, it's been continuously occupied 
by monks since then, and it predates many of the, well, all of the schisms. In, I mean, it dates from the period where you know Christianity was still uh, in its infancy and and was a a, a single. Uh, had not um, developed into its different denominations as we do now. It's said to be located at the place where God appeared to Moses um, in the burning bush. And here's an image of the library. And obviously the library at a monastery like that is going to contain extremely valuable cultural <coughs> artifacts. It preserves the second largest collection of codices and manuscripts in the world after the Vatican. And um, there are more than a dozen languages that represent in the library. And given the length of the time that this library is being gathered over time, those languages reflect changes of um, not just the languages in use in the region, but the languages of scholarship, the languages of religion, the, language of, of the, the, the cultural history of, of the use of language. Languages include Greek, Armenian, Arabic, Coptic, Hebrew, Georgian, Aramaic, uh, Syriac, and a number of others. And other important manuscripts that you might have heard of, the Codex Sinaiticus, um, which is now in the um, British Library, was there, and uh, the Syriac Sinaiticus is another um, manuscript, a well-known manuscript, which is, which is actually still there. Um, even though the monastery has never been um, overridden, over, uh, it's never been demolished or, or, or run by anyone else, the library had from time to time, it's had things removed from it. So there is a diaspora of um, objects from the library, and one of the, pr one of the aims, this is the separate project that Emil is working on and would like to lead in the future, this is just as an aside, is to build a virtual library to bring all of those um, manuscripts back together in a virtual format. A lot of them are in Russia, various libraries in Europe, um, and uh, the, the, the monastery would very much like to, um, to create a, a virtual reconstruction of the original library. Here's an example of, of, a, of a parchment, um, of a, a palimpsest, and you can actually see the text uh, underneath, which has been erased. Parchment, which is made from animal hides, as Todd said, was very expensive. It was before the invention of paper. Um, you, you, you had to reuse it because you couldn't afford to just you know, keep killing animals and <laughs> use up parchment the way we do paper today. Um, so you typically reuse paper, uh, parchment. And as these, um, you know, as the use of language and importance of languages changes, often there's one language overriding another language, Greek overriding Syriac or, or something like that. And also typically for readability, when you erase the text, you would often write the new text at right angles to the old text. So you rebind pieces of paper um, so that the, uh, when you reconstruct text, you, you, you're often, well, practically always, dealing with fragments that you've got to stick back together again as they were originally. Um, uh, to, to reconstruct the original, and of course there'll always be gaps. Um, not going to read through this list of names. This is the list of people who are working with Emil in, in the Sinai, and they are overlap pretty much with the team that worked on the Archimedes Palimpsest, and they are also pretty much the same subset of these people worked on the Livingston Project, which I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. Um, the person that we've worked with a fair bit is Mike Toth. Um, he's working with us on building the, the data archive um, and, and creating the, the, um, the standards that, that we want to, to build the archive. I'll talk a little bit about the archive in a, in a moment. So as Todd mentioned, this is um, these three projects, the Archimedes pro Project and the, the, um, the Livingston Project and the uh, Palmsess Project at the St. Catherine's Monastery, um, they're all international in scope. They all involve a lot of different um, people and organizations, and they're all funded in different <laughs> ways. Um, but it's the same, there's a lot of overlap. We've been invited by, through Emil for both the Livingston and the um, Sinai Palimpsests project to undertake these roles to publish, to, to create an archive of images and to publish those images. Um, to work on the creation of digital editions, and we've created two digital, we published two digital editions of recovered Livingston texts, which are available online. Um, we're hoping to work with St. Catharines on publishing critical editions of those manuscripts, 
Todd's going to talk a little bit, I think, a little bit later about the sensitivities and the political considerations that come into play, especially working with a very closed community like the monks in uh, St. Catharines. <coughs> and then scholars using um, the data need access to the data, but scholars also have their own issues of privacy, privacy, uh, uh, credit, all those sorts of things. Um, so we've set, created a set of policy, provide, create, provided an access mechanism using SFTP, secure FTP, so that scholars get access to the, uh, the images that they need, but the, so they can't see each other's work. And it was actually quite a, an effort to do that. And we'd like to build a more, more robust uh, data sharing environment, which is not, uh, not reliant on, on FTP. But that was the easiest route for us to go off the bat. Um, this is just an image of the, um, the Stokes imaging equipment. This is used in a lot of different places, not just for sp spectral, um, multispectral imaging, just for imaging in, in general. It's built to support very fragile manuscripts, which is uh, what we're dealing with in uh, the palimpsests from uh, at St. Catharines. And uh, it's built by Stokes Imaging, which is based in Austin and Texas. Um, we have another rig like this at UCLA, which we use for digitizing. Uh, it's actually not a, it doesn't have a cradle like this. We have a, a more upright version, but it comes in a number of different configurations for, uh, uh, with different feeding mechanisms for different types of digitization. But it's used at institutions like the, the National Archives and, and a number of others. Um, this is, uh, shows you the, the vacuum. This is a, a vacuum wedge which comes down. Uh, to maintain the, uh, the relationship between the, the page and the camera. And um, this is a very high-end mechanism, a cradle for holding the manuscript while they're being digitized. It actually, um, it's all computer driven, the software is written by Stokes, and it holds the page and turns the, the, uh, the binding of the codex so that it will not break so that it actually moves the, uh, the relationship between the front cover and the back cover in a, a rotating motion. And um, it also keeps the page at the same distance from the camera. So it actually there's a, a, a very fine motor which moves <coughs> the page or the whole codex up and uh, uh, as you turn the pages away from the camera, one page at a time, and it's actually that sensitive, extremely sensitive. Um, Okay, under the second aspect of multispectral imaging, which is the processing of these images and actually in to, um, uh, to reveal the text that, that you want to reveal. And um, there are a couple of, th there are a number of different techniques. I'm not going to go into any detail about them. I'll just sort of name them and talk generally about what they are. But these are mathematical processes, mathematical al algorithms in order to manipulate and enhance the raw data so that you can bring out the text that you're trying to restore. And it relies on the fact that different ink types on a given page um, behave differently under different bands of wavelengths of light. So that, um, you know, if, if uh, in the Livingston project, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, it, um, the Livingston project, you've got newsprint, you've got ink written over newsprint. So the ink is going to uh, reflect different wavelengths of light in a different intensity from the newsprint. And with um, erased text, the palimpsests, there'll be different ink types. There'll be actually probably a lot more subtle than the difference between differences between the ink of ink and of, of, of newsprint and ink. Um, uh, but there'll still be subtle differences in the ink, and they'll reflect light differently. Um, and then the different wave of the the bands that the monochromatic files that you've created by reflection, by capturing the reflection from the manuscript at different wavelengths um, can be combined in different ways to, um, uh, to reveal the text that you want to, to reveal. So principal component analysis is the combination of um, these different <coughs> images from the different wavelengths of light um, according to their statistical variance. And principal component analysis um, when I was thinking about how to explain this, what came to my mind as a 
physics major early in my life was uh, well, solving quadratic equations. You know, you have to when you're solving a quadratic equation, you have to work out. So you've got you're, you're dividing it into uh, different powers of of um, of a particular variable. And the other uh, the other thing that came to mind was um, Fourier analysis, where you're taking something and you're dividing it up, taking a complex wave and you're dividing it up into its independent frequencies. If you think of sound, dividing a sound up into its independent um, principal tones. And then I thought, well, that probably wouldn't carry over very well, and I couldn't think of a different thing. But anyway. Um, it's basically trying to take a set of data and divide it into components which are independent of each other or orthogonal. So, or if you think at right angles to each other. So if you think of that direction being made up of a bit of this way, a bit of this way. So I want to go into you know, that direction. I've got to go over there and I've got to go over there. You can divide it up into two directions which are at right angles to each other. Um, but it's the same thing. If you've got two different types of ink and you want to separate them um, and you do some sort of statistical analysis which divides the data that you have into two things which are independent of each other, they may or may not represent the two different ink types. And then you take, so once you've divided um, the data, these images, up into their different independent um, sets, you can play around with them and, and see if. And it is a playing around process. It's not like, oh, it just processes and then pops out. You actually have to experiment and find out which combination of frequencies in which um, adding and subtracting, um, what, what sort of combination will reveal the, the text that you're trying to reveal. Pseudo color is another technique that involves taking these essentially monochromatic in, images at different wavelengths and storing them in the red, green, and blue bands of the TIFF image. This is just a way of representing the image. And then playing around with the frequency, com combining them at different frequencies, um, and then displaying them. And I uh, in a couple of slides, you'll see a difference. You'll see a, um, uh, an example of that. But I mentioned here four different principal component analysis types, 13 different types of pseudo color, right? So that means you're creating lot, this is for each page. So for each page, there's going to be so you have 16 source files. You've now got four different PCA files. You've got 13 different pseudo color files. So suddenly your data archive is now even bigger. So if you're doing hundreds of man pages of hundreds of manuscripts and you're creating this many different very high um, resolution images, you're, you're creating an enormous archive of content. And here's just an example of, of some of the resulting files. So we've done this analysis. We've put these different... Um, You've done the PCA analysis and you've fed these images into RGB channels of a TIFF image and then you represent them, um, you'll see that the different texts come out in different colors. And this is from the Livingston project where the, um, this is news, this is ink, homemade ink from the berries of, uh, the juice of a berry in Africa, I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment, written over 19th century newsprint. And that's what it looks like top left. You see the newsprint and the homemade ink that David, David Livingston used is, is just faded away. Um, so that's just a regular color image. And then all the rest are derivatives using the PCA technique and studio, pseudo color techniques. And you can see that the top right hand color, top right hand, that's a pseudo color um, image where you've got the uh, ink has now come out in red because that's in the red channel of, of, the, of the TIFF image. Um, and you see various other manifestations here. And uh, some are easier to read at the bottom, but you see the bottom left one, um, that one where the ink has come out in blue, the, the newsprint is almost non, um, is, is almost illegible. So a lot of experimentation to, to build this. Um, this is from the uh, St. Catherine's Palimpsest project, same sort of thing. Um, so the top, the lower left is just the standard color image. That's what it looks like in just under natural white light. And then the top left and the, and the bottom right uh, are different versions of that same image uh, processed in, in various ways. And uh, this is another image from the Livingston project, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. But it was some, um, uh, this is probably the most readable 
So this is the end of the process. This is what the scholars can then use to actually create an edition of, of the text on the right. And uh, that was what they started with on the left. The name of the newspaper was The Standard, that's the you see there. Uh, this is an example of uh, Syriac written over Syriac. Um, color, the, the original color image on the left and on the right you'll see that the overtext and the undertext have been brought out in, in gold and, and dark blue. Um, and here's a before and after view. So there's the original text. Again, this is from uh, St. Catherine's. And then magically there's the undertext which is being brought out. Um, so these two projects are slightly different. Um, they're obviously dealing with very different types of material. The David Livingston project were restoring, the objective was to restore diaries with an ink that he made himself as he was lost in the area. He wasn't actually lost, but he was, um, he, he had, didn't have any more ink. All he had to write on was newspaper. So he made his own ink and he wrote it over newspaper and uh, to create a, a, a data archive and to publish critical editions. And at St. Catharines, the, the objective is to render these in, in ancient texts and um, to identify and paleographically describe these texts and then to publish legible, legible images online um, for scholars to use. So very similar but slightly, slightly different in, in focus. Um, here's just a, a, a few points of contrast which I've already mentioned. Um, the, the period that we're dealing with, um, the type of, of text and uh, uh, what the subtext is. Um, on the Livingston project, there are actually three layers that needed distinguishing, um, which is very different from Palimpsest. You've got the newsprint underneath, then you've got the text which was written over the newsprint, but then you've also got bleed through from the text on the back. And so part of the process involved trying to get rid of the bleed through as well. Um, but it was all in English, and the newsprint was really nothing you, we cared about. Whereas the you know, Palimpsest, you're talking about erased text and, and text that we do do care about quite a bit. And some of the um, palimpsests at, um, I don't know the percentage, but in, uh, in St. Catharines have been used many times. The par same parchment has been used many times over. Uh, so there's sometimes more than two texts. <coughs> and uh, the other thing about religious texts um, is that you often dealing, usually actually dealing with texts that you already know, and so you're not really, it's not like the Archimedes Project where you're identifying texts that uh, you don't know, but you might be finding a text which has subtle important differences that scholars are, would be interested in, and also um, texts maybe in languages that you didn't have before, like a, a, a well-known text which you know maybe we didn't have in Aramaic or Syriac or something before which we now have, sorts of things that scholars care about. Just as an, another aside, one of the projects we've worked on is, is digitizing um, Armenian manuscripts. And in discussions on, with our Armenian specialist on campus on what we should digitize, um, he actually said, don't digitize the religious content. Digitize the secular stuff, because people generally haven't cared about that. And it's much more likely to be um, unique, unknown, original. Whereas the religious content is much more studied. A lot of people doing that, texts that we already know. I thought it was interesting take on that. Um, this is the home page of the Livingston Project. So let me talk a little bit, we talked mostly about the Emil Project. Let me talk a little bit about the Livingston Project and just what it is, because it's actually pretty interesting and, and, and if you don't know anything about it. Um, this is the home page of the project that we host at UCLA. It is the critical edition of, um, two different critical editions so far, the Field Diary uh, of 1871 and um, what was essentially the field diary from 1870, which was uh, this letter from Bambari, which was a pilot project that we worked on um, to build the uh, techniques, the, the, the publication techniques. And all the different folks that have uh, contributed support for this project at various times are listed up here. And it's also been um, peer reviewed by, by nines, and so we were happy about that, so we added that icon on the page. Perhaps not the most beautiful, be beautifully designed page, um, but one of the interesting things about working with the scholar Adrian Wisnicki on this project was that 
we gave him a lot of control over how everything was to be published. It was basically, we were his servants in a sense. We were going to publish everything as he wanted it published. So he actually did a lot of the design himself. That's not an excuse. It's just, I, that was just a decision that we made um, that we were going to give him that sort of control, uh, which was fine. So, uh, so this publication reveals for the first time the original record of, of uh, Livingston's um, experience in the African jungle where he was, uh, um, he was stranded for a, for a number of months. And the original texts of his diaries were unknown. Um, they'd been restored and they'd been published for the first time here. But he had, he had published his diaries himself after he got back to Britain. And so one of the interesting things about this is that we have a comparison of the original with his publication of his diaries after he got back to Britain. And um, there are subtle differences. And, and one of the scholars who led this project, Adrian Wisnicki, um, his, um, his argument is that uh, after he got back to uh, Britain, um, I keep wanting to say England, but he was Scottish, so I'm being culturally sensitive here. <laughs> um, if he got back to, to England, he um, he published, he, he's, in his published diaries, he seems to downplay the role that his own slaves might have played in a massacre of Africans by Arabic traders uh, at the village where he was stranded at this period of time. And um, as you may know, David Livingston was um, an abolitionist, and so he supported the abolition of slavery. So when he was publishing his diaries, he would have been very sensitive to the fact that his own servants might have African in Africa might have had some role in this, and he wanted to downplay that. It's not a sure thing, but that was one of the scholarly outcomes of, of this of this project. Um, okay, what are we doing for time? Point point. This is, uh, <coughs> as I mentioned. Uh, the massacre that took place while Livingston was there was actually very traumatic for him and probably uh, colored a lot of his, his um, social um, opinions after that point. Um, and as I've mentioned earlier, um, at the time he was writing these diaries, he created his own, read his own ink out of a local berry and wrote over it. The only thing he had to write on at the time um, was, was it. And what he was describing in this diary is this massacre was, was the massacre of about 400 to 500 Africans, mostly women, on a single day, which was a, um, an experience which was sort of unprecedented for him. And uh, this is the period, the end of which um, Morton, Henry Morton Stanley, a reporter sent by the New York Herald, came across Livingston in the jungle and he said, all together now, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Um, that's where that comes from. And this is, so this is the period immediately um, preceding that, that meeting. Um, so what we've published online is um, a whole bunch of different things, as I said, um, pretty much dictated by what Adrian wanted to, to publish. So there's the full text. So, all of, so, so complete all the images of the pages. Um, both unprocessed and processed, uh, the complete text, uh, searchable text, it's all being marked up in TEI, published online. So fairly standard sort of online publication. Um, this is just an image of the website that allows you to download PDF, XML versions, as well as to read in parallel three different versions of the text. So the restored text on the left, uh, two published versions, uh, the version that he published after he got back to, to England. And so you can actually read the differences yourself. So the website that we have contains, uh, as I mentioned, all those things, plus historical narrative and analysis, um, technical information, extensive supportive documentation, dynamic comparison of recovered, that's the, the piece that you just saw. Um, an extraordinary amount of detail, much, much, much more detail than you could possibly put in a, um, uh, in a, in a printed publication. And I would say, I mean, to my, in my experience, much more detail than most people. I, I, Dave, Adrian has taken advantage 
of the online environment to publish much, much, much more than most people would even think of publishing. I mean, most scholarly publishing online these days is really just an online version of what you might put in a printed article, right? Just the same number of footnotes and all of that sort of thing. What Adrian has done is to put an extraordinary number of working documents. So as the team have worked together and they created schedules, working documents, um, they exchanged emails about shall we do this and shall we do this and how, we, how should we do that. All of that has been included. I mean, and it's the stuff that you would not normally put in a scholarly article. So this website contains everything from a formal critical edition to links to, and you store these, e these emails are hosted on the site, emails and, and other working documents, all sorts of things that you would not normally find. Um, and then there is the complete archive. So there's an enormous number of, um, this, this, is, this is not a huge document, so it's, it's not really a huge number of images, but a large number of images for every original page. So all of those original um, spectral scans, or photo, uh, Im uh, digitized images, as well as all of the processed images, a very large number of processed images, um, all marked up, uh, sorry, all, um, following a file naming convention that Mike Toth and the rest of the team uh, designed so that uh, the identity of all of these files is very clearly explained. Um, TI transcriptions of the, of the diary, and we provided TI services and advice for that. And the other thing which is remarkable is that these bottom two points, um, instead of linking out to a lot of content, um, Adrian has embedded that into the site as well so that um, things like uh, standards that are referred to, instead of just linking out to the standard, even well-known standards, um, they've downloaded them and actually put them as part of the archive so that you can, um, so, so that the standard as it existed at the point of time it was used is, is captured. Um, as well as things like all the XML schemas and CSS files, again, things that um, might exist, have existed outside the site are actually all stored on the site. Um, which brings up the issue of you know, co-location versus distribution and publishing this sort of content. Do you put everything together all in one place or do you use the the power of the web by just referring to all the different pieces. So that if you're referring, using a particular standard, just reference that standard. If you, um, uh, you're, you're referring to particular documents which might exist in some scholarly archive or in some not so scholarly archive, you know, do you download them and put them all together in a package or do you just link out to them and, and refer to them? In this particular case, Adrian made the decision to download everything he possibly could, put it in the archive so it's all there. So everything is co-located and is remarkably complete. And this makes it a lot more robust and, and sustainable in the long term. So, um, so our role in this particular case is, uh, for, uh, for the Livingston project in particular, and to um, th th these services that we currently provide refer to both the Livingston project and the um, and, and the Emerald Palmacist project, the St. Uh, Catherine's project. Um, so we have a version of the equipment at UCLA which was used for testing and for creating the workflow, the technical workflow. So the team that went to Egypt came to UCLA and we gave them a room where all the equipment set up and um, the Emerald owns that particular version of the equipment and they did all of the testing of the software and the strobe lighting and uh, the whole physical setup of the apparatus and the testing of the apparatus, they did that. So we, we create, created and, and uh, gave them access to this laboratory. We provide data storage, preservation, and access services. So um, basically just giving them storage space, secure storage space on our servers. Um, and then we're working with them on developing a scholarly virtual workspace. So as I mentioned, uh, we currently have an F S FTP based service where scholars can download the images that they need for their work. Um, <coughs> we want to do something a little bit more robust than that over time. Where they can also share, or not share if they wish, transcriptions and, of edited and edited texts. And then we also provided uh, TEI support. So um, we have a TEI expert on our staff, uh, Elizabeth McCauley, 
And so she worked with Adrian and his team of students who were doing all the TI markups, so we provide that also. And then we're providing this publication service. Um, the last item there doesn't exist right now, and it's something that the uh, sci image scientists have work are working on, and we would uh, like to uh, assist in the publication. This is, instead of all this processing of images um, proactively, and then you're know, coming up with a final image, it would be very nice to be able to work with the source images, spectral images, dynamically online so that um, either for instructional or research purposes, people can take the source files, add and subtract, create their own pseudo color images, create, do their own PCA analysis, do that in real time, suppose so people can reconstruct how someone might have restored a text or um, uh, come up with, um, you know, use this technique for, um, for, new, for new work. Okay. All right. So, um, first, an apology. You know, you guys came here for a, a technical talk in libraries. We've given you a history lesson to some degree on some of this content. Um, uh, Stephen talked about the um, the history of the Livingston Diary itself. Um, I just wanted to mention a little bit about uh, the actual uh, project. Um, the complexity of the data management and the size of the files and the scope. Um, this project actually had a few homes before it hit UCLA. Um, and some of the places that uh, it lived, National Library of Scotland, uh, um, they, I, the project team felt like they didn't have the uh, technical expertise, I guess, to continue to manage uh, the data in a way uh, that was needed for um, for the project, so it ended up coming to UCLA. Uh, through uh, Emil, uh, we were both receiving funding from the Arcadia Foundation to do interesting work, um, and as a result, um, you know that that project, uh, Livingston and Livingston Online, um, uh, is at UCLA now. Um, I wanted to mention a little bit about the content itself. It's very, very obviously very, very fragile. Um, you know, this, uh, a big focus of the project has been really to um, keep, uh, to enrich the content owners' uh, libraries, their own, their own virtual spaces. So um, uh, this is not a project where you take from St. Catharines and you ship it to LA and we scan it uh, and keep it. This is a project where um, you, we sent a team to St. Catharines to do the scanning. We keep a copy of the scanned images at UCLA. We also leave a, a copy there. Uh, it's about enriching the content. Uh, it's about enriching the local archive as well. Um, so the St. Catharines project uh, actually was on and off for a number of years. Um, uh, the history, uh, it, this library at St. Catharines is you know, one of the biggest libraries in the world of uh, uh, these codices and these palimpsests. Um, the history of that library, uh, Stephen alluded to a little bit, there have been, uh, this uh, St. Catharines had the oldest copy of the Bible in the world. Uh, some number of years ago, uh, a Russian scholar visited St. Catharines and uh, left with that Bible. Uh, and various stories about how it ended up at the British Library uh, years later, there's still a lot of uh, trust issues with, um, uh, with St. Catharines and it's taken quite a long time for uh, the collaborative uh, work uh, to move forward because of that, uh, that those trust issues. Um, also, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of scholarly competition to get access to this stuff. Uh, what we're looking at, uh, what Stephen showed you, uh, those images, this is the first time in uh, thousands of years that that text has been seen. There's a lot of scholars who want to be the first one in there to, to um, decode, uh, read that text underneath. Um, and, you know, for all these reasons, these projects are uh, actually very, uh, can be very political, can be very uh, sensitive. Uh, there's a lot of security in place. Um, you know, what we uh, try to do throughout this process is uh, help, uh, help our collaborators uh, and help the um, uh, the content owners feel comfortable with sharing this content in a scholarly fashion. Um, and so that's really what the, 
what the library does with these things. Um, we also, uh, part of what we're doing is uh, a lot of best practices for materials handling to ensure the preservation of the fragile historic resource. That's very important to the content owners. Um, you know, we strive to achieve the highest standards for image quality and fidelity of the, uh, to the original. This is again uh, treating the text um, in uh, with respect, respecting uh, uh, you know the original, um, and we're also doing uh, quite a bit with uh, managing the image files uh, that conform to best practices for conservation. Uh, so a lot of that, you know, that's sort of uh, kind of a picture as to what, you know, what some of the politics are behind uh, dealing with some of these, uh, some of these texts. A little bit about our future work. Um, you know, uh, this is a pretty new science that we're dealing with, and so a lot of the things we've been focusing on over the past couple years is really trying to make the process more efficient. Um, make, trying to make um, uh, the data we capture uh, uh, transportable. So these, you know, these very large, large number of image files. How do we get them around? Um, uh, so we want to also we're focused on creating a very high quality data archive um, that conforms to standards, best practices, uh, and is preservable for future generations. Uh, and again, uh, strive for increased efficiency and cost effectiveness. So these are really expensive projects to do. You know, you, you don't just set up a multi-spectral, I can't go down to Fry's and buy one. Um, you know, these are uh, very, it takes a team, you know, so at St. Catherine's Monastery, there's uh, six professionals on site doing this work. Um, that's a, it's a very expensive process. Um, and anything we can do to increase the efficiency is, is really what we're working on. Um, it, just a quick demo. This is a um, what we had, what we have set up at UCLA. This is where the project scientists came and did their um, experimentation. Uh, it's uh, it's actually a very small room we provided for them, uh, very cramped spaces. But uh, this is what it looks like at UCLA, um, and this is the same rig set up at St. Catherine's Monastery. Um, it's a 39 meg uh, megapixel monochrome camera. Uh, we've got this uh, it's a bellows that's computer controlled. Uh, this is a 120 uh, millimeter quartz lens and the dual filter wheel. I mean, th these are just, I, I showed you earlier the slide where uh, the different wavelengths were bouncing around. This is what the actual camera looks like. This is what it, what it looks like set up at St. Catharines. And this is the librarian at St. Catherine's. So this is uh, Father Joseph. Justin. Justin, thank you. Um, and he's uh, very interested in the process. Uh, Stephen told me just before the presentation that he's actually a Texan. Um, so he's uh, moved from Texas to uh, the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt. Um, and he's uh, very interested in um, how the project turns out. Um, so let's see. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.